tonight. Reports released. Iran releases more details surrounding President Raisi's fatal crash. The nation continuing to mourn the loss of a leader. Trilateral talks. China, Japan and South Korea prepare to galvanize their ties at the Seoul summit despite tensions in the region. Trump talks. For the first time in eight years, former President Donald Trump rallies in New York. The unprecedented move stirring up the Pol Pot. And never too late, a 90-year-old astronaut fulfills his lifelong dream to reach for the stars. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're joining us on World News on our final bulletin for the week. A lot has happened across the globe since we last came to you, from the crisis in New Caledonia to rallies in the U.S. But before that, we start off with updates on the situation in Iran. The general staff of Iran's armed forces released the first report of the causes of a recent helicopter crash that resulted in the deaths of Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and his entourage. According to the report released, following the crash, a senior investigation committee composed of experts, specialists and technicians arrived at the scene. According to the report, the helicopter had remained on its predetermined course all along the way and had not deviated from the flight route. Almost one minute and a half before the incident, the pilot of the crash helicopter had contacted the other two helicopters of the President's convoy. No trace of bullets or similar items have been detected on the wreckage of the crash helicopter. After crashing into the mountain, the helicopter had caught fire. Complications of the region, fog and low temperature, had caused the search and rescue operations to continue until nightfall and then throughout the night. It had a no suspicious issue had been detected in the conversations between the watchover and the flight crew. And over now to the mounting tensions between Taiwan and China. Taiwan's defense forces deployed F-16 fighter jets, a mobile air defense system and a surveillance drone to monitor and shadow China's drills around the island on its second day. It came as Chinese state television said China's military sent multiple bombers to conduct mock strikes in its Taiwan drills, which began three days after Taiwan's new president Lai ching te took office. Taipei has condemned Beijing's actions, though analysts regional diplomats and senior Taiwan officials noted the scale of the drill so far was smaller than the similar ones in 2022. With Beijing considering the island's new president a separatist, its military exercises were widely anticipated by Taiwanese and foreign officials. However, they still raise the risk of accidents or miscalculation. And amid such mounting border tensions, South Korea, Japan and China will revive their trilateral cooperation with a meeting in Seoul this weekend. They will hold a highly anticipated three-way summit on Monday. South Korea, Japan and China will hold their first trilateral summit in over four years with the aim of fully restoring and normalizing their three-way cooperation on trade, climate response and interpersonal exchanges. Kim Tae-ho, South Korea's principal deputy national security adviser on Thursday, said President Yoon Seo-go will hold three-way talks on Monday with Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and Chinese Premier Li Chang. The three are expected to focus on six main areas of cooperation, including people-to-people -people exchanges, climate change and sustainable development, health and ageing demographics, as well as science and technology and disaster and safety response. According to a presidential official, their talks will be concluded with a joint statement, with Yun, Kushida and Chang possibly holding a joint press conference. The three-way talks stalled since December 2019 come amid strained relations over a number of bilateral disputes, on top of tensions in the Indo-Pacific region as the United States and China engage in geopolitical competition. After South Korea and Japan took major steps to patch up their differences last year and restored bilateral trade and security ties, Seoul has been pushing to revive their three-way talks with Beijing. While Yoon, Kishida and Chang will also discuss regional issues and ways to respond to complex global crises, a presidential official told reporters they are unlikely to focus on contentious issues. These include North Korea's weapons cooperation with Russia and the possibility of Seoul and Tokyo joining the security pact by Australia, the United Kingdom and the US. 
Before the highly anticipated talks, the South Korean leader will hold separate summits with his counterparts on Sunday afternoon before a welcoming banquet. Yoon and Chang will discuss strengthening strategic communication after months-long tension between the two countries, along with trade, investment and cultural ties. With Kashida, Yoon will address Korean Peninsula affairs as well as regional and global issues, as well as their trilateral cooperation with the United States. Observers believe bilateral tensions over messenger app Line may also be raised. And still in the region, South Korea is taking on the rotating presidency of the UN Security Council next month for the first time in 10 years. Seoul is set to push for public discussions on cybersecurity, a topic that hasn't been covered by the official UNSC agenda previously. For the first time in a decade, South Korea is set to hold the rotating presidency of the UN Security Council next month. South Korea, which is a non-permanent UNSC member, will chair the council for one month as the council's 15 member states rotate on a monthly basis. During a press meeting, Seoul's top envoy to the UN, Hwang jun guk said undertaking the presidency is an important role in coordinating the UNSC agenda, adding that South Korea will be ready to convene a UNSC meeting in the event of a provocation by North Korea. Huang emphasized that the role of the chairing country is important as it affects the direction of discussions on key global issues and international opinion. During its month-long presidency, South Korea will seek to hold high-level public discussions on the topic of cybersecurity. Seoul has been heavily focused on such issues due to evolving threats by Pyongyang in the security domain. For this, Foreign Minister Cho Taeyar plans to preside over the session. South Korea's top envoy to the UN stressed that malicious cyber activities on key infrastructure and theft of civilian data and cryptocurrency are threats that all countries face. Huang added that despite the importance of cybersecurity, the topic has not been dealt with as an official UNSC agenda. Seoul also plans to hold public discussions under the theme Child and Armed Conflicts at the request of the UN Secretariat. The ambassador expressed his hope that South Korea's presidency will contribute to the nation's push to expand its diplomatic horizons and emerge as a global pivotal state. We're seeing more diplomacy moves take place tonight. Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in Minsk to meet with Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. According to the Kremlin, the leaders will hold wide-ranging talks on Thursday and Friday. For more on this, we have other than the world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. What's the latest, Minoli? Yes, Anurag. The Russian leader was welcomed with gifts as he disembarked from his aircraft and was greeted by Lukashenko and other officials. Shortly after leaving the tarmac, Putin and Lukashenko sat down together, speaking briefly before the cameras. Russia and Belarus are close allies with Minsk set to take part in exercises aimed at simulating preparations for the launch of tactical nuclear weapons this month. Belarus has offered Russia logistical support during its conflict with Ukraine, with Russian forces entering Ukraine from Belarusian territory during their initial offensive against Kyiv in February 2022. Separately, Belarusian state news agency Belta reported that Lukashenko had appointed Pavel Muraveko as the new chief of the Belarusian army's general staff. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much for the update. That was other than the news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. An update on the fatal flight from Singapore Airlines now. The airline has tweaked its in-flight seatbelt sign policies and altered at least one flight route after the turbulence incident this week killed one person and left dozens more hospitalized with spinal injuries, according to the airline and flight data. The airline said it is adopting a more cautious approach to turbulence, like not serving hot drinks or meals when the seatbelt sign is on. A London to Singapore flight carrying 211 passengers and 18 crew diverted to Bangkok for an emergency landing on Tuesday. The plane was struck by turbulence that flung passengers and crew around the cabin. The daily London to Singapore route has completed two flights since the incident. But those journeys have not flown over the part of Myanmar where the sudden turbulence occurred. Flight Radar 24 shows they flew instead over the Bay of Bengal and Andaman Sea. A 73-year-old British passenger died of a suspected heart attack in Tuesday's incident. 
A passenger said some people's heads had slammed into the lights above the seats and broken the panels. As of late Thursday, 46 passengers and two crew members were still in a hospital in Bangkok. A Thai official said 20 of the 46 remained in intensive care. Going in for a short commercial break now, more world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. An attempt to quell the chaos was made in New Caledonia. French President Emmanuel Macron said after a day of talks in New Caledonia that he would delay a voting reform that had triggered deadly riots on the France-ruled Pacific Island and try to seek a new political arrangement. I made a commitment for this reform not to be implemented by force in the current context and that we would give ourselves a few weeks to be able to allow for a return to calm, the resumption of dialogue, with a vision towards a general agreement. At least six people have died in more than a week of protests triggered by anger at electoral reforms passed by lawmakers in mainland France to let more French nationals vote in New Caledonia's elections. The island's indigenous Kanak people fear the move will dilute their votes and make it harder for any future referendum on independence to pass. Macron arrived on the Pacific island Thursday for talks with local leaders meant to turn the page on the violence. After a helicopter flyover of areas wrecked by arson, he said that the state of emergency would be lifted once protesters removed their roadblocks. And he said his ultimate aim was still to sign the controversial measure into law once calm was restored. This reform, although it's rejected by some here, which has fed the violence, it has democratic legitimacy. The bill proposed by the government has been voted with a clear majority, both in the National Assembly and in the Senate. I say this as president. We don't just throw away popular sovereignty like a mere piece of paper. Macron said he would take stock of the situation, quote, within a month. New Caledonia is the world's third largest miner of nickel, but the sector is in crisis. One in five residents live below the poverty threshold, and economic inequalities on the island are stark. And on the road to the White House tonight, former President Donald Trump has broken political norms by visiting one of the most deep blue areas in New York City, a town not necessarily known for its kindness to Republicans. If a New Yorker can't save this country, no one can. During his rally in the deep blue South Bronx, former President Trump pledged to turn New York red. It won't be easy. New York City has voted for the Democratic presidential candidate in every election since 1924. Last night, several thousand people showed up for Trump. It doesn't matter whether you're black or brown or white or whatever the hell color you are, it doesn't matter. We are all Americans. The district is more than 50 percent Hispanic and 30 percent black or African-American. But polls show Trump making gains against President Biden among those groups, largely because of concern about the border and the economy. These millions and millions of people that are coming into our country, the biggest impact and the biggest negative impact is against our black population and our Hispanic population who are losing their jobs, losing their housing, losing everything they can lose. Trump promised to deport undocumented immigrants, lower crime and further reduce inflation, a message the crowd wanted to hear. Earlier, the Biden campaign launched a series of TV and radio ads challenging Trump's claims about his accomplishments for the black community. Of course I hate these people. The ad begins with Trump saying, of course, I hate these people, a remark he made in 1989, referring to the men who were accused and later wrongly convicted in the brutal rape of a jogger in Central Park in what became known as the Central Park Five case. Donald Trump disrespecting black folk is nothing new. He was sued for refusing to rent his apartments to black families and called for the execution of five innocent black and brown teenagers. And it's more than anger, it's hatred. The Trump campaign called the ad another cheap attempt from the Biden campaign to gaslight black voters.
still in the U.S. now. President Joe Biden said the U.S. and Kenya do not share borders but beliefs at a state dinner hosted for Kenya's President William Ruto at the White House. Biden's also expected to designate Kenya as a major non-NATO ally. U.S. President Joe Biden is expected to designate Kenya as a major non-NATO ally, a source familiar with the plans has said. That would make Kenya the first sub-Saharan African country to receive such a designation. The announcement is expected during a three-day state visit by Kenyan President William Ruto. As he welcomed Ruto to the White House on Wednesday, Biden said he planned to visit Africa in February, though that is after the next U.S. presidential election. A range of issues are being discussed during Ruto's trip, including trade and debt relief, as well as the way forward for Ukraine, Sudan and Haiti. Kenya is currently planning to send troops to help address a security crisis in Haiti as part of a UN-backed mission. Hello, everyone. Okay. On Wednesday, Biden said he and Ruto would also launch a new era of technology cooperation. That includes work on cybersecurity, artificial intelligence and semiconductors. From Silicon Valley to Silicon Savannah, uh, our people have brought us forward and they've pioneered new technologies that are transforming millions of lives. Our young population, talented, educated, innovative, and American technology that is cutting edge, and investment capital and investors that are hungry for opportunities, not just in Kenya, but in our continent, is a perfect match for this moment. For the main course, Ruto's trip also includes a state dinner, marking 60 years of ties between the two countries. The non-NATO ally designation is granted to close allies that have strategic working relationships with the US military. The apparent courtship reflects Washington's desire to deepen relations with Kenya, which also has long had close ties with Russia and China. The weather woes continue over in America as there were over 200 severe storm reports from New York all the way to Texas. A fifth person was also killed in what is believed to be a tornado-related incident about 25 miles from Greenfield, Iowa. Tonight, extreme weather threatening to upend Memorial Day weekend plans for a record number of families hitting the roads and skies. Powerful storms slamming New York City this morning, 60 mile an hour winds taking down trees and power lines in the suburbs. The FAA says this is the busiest Memorial Day for air travel in nearly 15 years, with today being the busiest day of the entire stretch. More than 53,000 flights expected to take off. The FAA telling GMA it's all hands on deck for their 45,000 employees. And the weather has been at times out of control. Overnight, an EF2 tornado with 120 mile an hour winds tearing through Temple, Texas, north of Austin, and in Greenfield, Iowa, where we now know the tornado that killed four people and injured dozens was an EF4 with winds up to 185 miles an hour. They're now racing to clean up those obliterated neighborhoods with more severe weather bearing down again tonight. Here's some interesting space news for you now. Astronomers have spotted dozens of rogue planets floating free from their stars after tuning the Euclid Space Telescope to look at a distant region of the Milky Way. The European Space Agency on Thursday released new images taken by Euclid Space Telescope. Astronomers mapped dozens of rogue planets floating in space using the Euclid Space Telescope to study a distant region of the Milky Way. Images include the star-forming region Messier 78 in the Orion constellation, shrouded in interstellar dust, as well as Abel 2390, a giant conglomeration of more than 50,000 Milky Way-like galaxies. Coming less than a year since the Euclid Space Telescope was launched, the ESA called the five images unprecedented and a treasure trove. The ESA launched the Billion Dollar Observatory project last year with a six-year mission to create a three-dimensional map of the cosmos. Let's take a short commercial break now. We'll be right back with more world news. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. There are some goals in life that will take decades or even more than that to complete. But it's always important to never give up on pursuing those goals so that it can become a reality at least someday far, far in the future. Well, this specific astronaut stuck to his guns and showed us it's better late than never. It's a trip he's waited over six decades to take. At 90 years and eight months old, Ed DeWight is officially the oldest person ever to fly to space. Former Air Force pilot Captain Ed Dwight was once tapped by President John F. Kennedy to be the first black astronaut candidate. This is how he described the experience to CBS News in 2022. When I got this letter November the 4th, 1961, uh, offering me this opportunity to be the first Negro astronaut, I thought these dudes were crazy. After four years of training with NASA, Dwight was booted from the space program. Are you now, in fact, completely out of the astronaut program? Is there a possibility of you ever being back in? I don't know. I don't have any idea. He went on to have a successful corporate career and in his retirement years has flourished as an artist. There it is, touchdown of the crew capsule. But even at 90 years old, the allure of space still called to him. Five, four, command engine start, two, one, zero. Ignition. On a 10 minute flight on Blue Origin's New Shepard, Dwight got to see the Earth from space, a dream he had long since put behind him. According to Blue Origin, the crew experienced about three minutes of weightlessness after they reached an altitude of 65 miles, which is a few miles above the internationally recognized boundary between the discernible atmosphere and space. Dwight grabs the most senior spot on the list of astronauts by just a few months. In 2021, William Shatner of Star Trek fame was also 90 years old at the time of his Blue Origin flight. A dream well kept for that long deserves such a satisfying payoff. But that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News Wrapping Up the Week. Tune in again on Monday for more key updates from across the globe. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.